CEO of the National Performance Network and Visual Artists Network. Just want to make sure that's clear. The second speaker will be Jose Torres Tama, who is an artist and cultural worker from New Orleans, Louisiana. Okay, uh, Arte Porturo Productions. Um, the next speaker will be Sarayuki Higuchi, okay, who is the Secretary General of Arts NPO, based out of Kyoto, Japan. All right, and finally, we're gonna have Molly Quinlan Hayes, who's from South Arts and does a they have a program called Arts Ready, which she'll talk about some things, and she'll talk about that program, which actually really addresses these issues in a holistic way. Okay? You ready, MK? Yes, I'm just um, wondering why, why this isn't done. It's connected, and it was up before, so. Mm. Brian, do you know where the guy is, or can you go? I'll find the guy. Okay. okay. <laughs> I will, I will talk Why don't you first. start, MK, and, yes, then, and we'll I'll talk get first. And, great. Um, you're going to give me a time signal, um, and I what am. I have is some examples of some artist projects. So, um, I just want to back up and say that um, NPN Van's experience with, uh, in our case, in New Orleans, man-made disasters, because while Hurricane ah, Katrina ah. was an extremely strong storm. It was what we refer to as the federal floods, the levees bursting, um, which were um, poorly constructed by the Army Corps of Engineers um, that caused the damage and the devastation that took place in New Orleans. Um, so um, from our observation, among the first responders, if you will, of people who came back to New Orleans, because the city literally emptied out after Katrina. There were about 100,000 people who did not evacuate and who could not evacuate. And those are the ones that you saw in the Superdome and in the Convention Center. And um, it was about a month after Katrina when they started letting people back into New Orleans. People in the Convention Center and the people in the Superdome were eventually evacuated. Um, and dispersed, and we have a New Orleans diaspora now across the United States because there are many people who went to different places, and um, a, a substantial portion of poor people, majority African American, who were evacuated have not been able to come back, and I think that is a political issue that we, um, we all need to be aware of, and that is because um, primarily of poverty, the impact of poverty. Um, and Jose, I know, will refer to some other aspects of it. But as people came back, it was artists who were among the very first to come back. And artists came back not just to take care of themselves, but to lend their skills and to engage their skills as artists, their creativity, their ability to collect stories and do storytelling, their visual abilities, um, to work with communities everywhere um, as volunteers in order to um, engage in recovery. So um, I have some examples of, I'm gonna see if it comes up. Um, two specific projects. to describe um, is called, was called Transforma. <coughs> and Transforma was initiated by a team of artists, um, two of whom were from outside of New Orleans, and uh, one was from inside New Orleans. And Rick Lowe, uh, Project Row Houses, who is a, uh, which is a band partner, um, and uh, Rick is an artist, and he's the founder of Project Row House. Um, and Sam Duran, who's an, another visual artist, came to New Orleans to offer their help. And what distinguished their approach to working, and I think this is an important value of people going, coming from the outside to a place, is they didn't come in to do their project. They came in to work with 
people already on the ground, and in this case artists who were already in the city and already on the ground, and support their work in whatever way possible. And so Transformer Project, which had a discreet beginning and end, and um, the information here, there was a publication, and this website, which is T-R-A-N-S-F-O-R-M-A projects, plural, dot org, um, is um, an archive of the publication that documented the work the Transformer did, and it sunsetted in uh, 2010. So um, unlike what may happen in other circumstances where something gets started and then people don't seem to know how to end it or want to end it um, because it's doing great work and the, uh, an institution or organization can drift on and on for a long time, but the fact of having a defined time period um, I think made this project more effective. Uh, so they, um, there were two major aspects of what Transforma did. Um, they had pilot projects and they had a mini grant regranting program. So the p three pilot projects um, focused on different aspects of how art artists and communities work together um, to achieve, um, in this case, recovery and relief. The first was called Home New Orleans, and I'm going to go in a little bit more into that. Home New Orleans worked in a variety of different neighborhoods, and as that project evolved, uh, the opportunity to bridge the differences between neighborhoods, because like in any city, neighborhoods often see themselves as um, so distinct from one another that they have nothing in common. When in fact, of course, when you live in a city in particular, there's much that particular individual neighborhoods have in common. So Home New Orleans evolved to having individual projects in different areas of the city, such as Lakeview and Central City and the Lower Ninth Ward, and found ways to bring the, work, the cultural workers and the artists from those communities together at the end of the project so that they can learn one another from one another and be a learning community in addition to succeeding with their projects. Um, the second project that Transforma supported was uh, Operation Pay, Pay Dirt, which you heard some of from yesterday if you heard Mel Chin's keynote project. Um, and Mel Chin continues to work in New Orleans and um, work with NPN uh, to uh, achieve the, uh, the funding, the, the dollar bills that they are creating with young people. And you heard yesterday they still have about 100,000 more that they want to create. And the plan is to take that pallet of $100 bills that have been created by young people in schools primarily, but by artists as well. Um, and of course, in the process of going to the schools, um, they're educating young people about the dangers of lead in the soil. I mean, the fact is, is that every major city in the United States that has any history has contaminated uh, soil from lead pollution, which is primarily from automobile exhaust over the years before we put different kinds of emission controls. And um, where there is, for instance, you cannot put a vegetable garden in the ground in an inner city backyard anywhere in the United States. You need to have a raised bed if you are going to plant something that you are going to consume because plants absorb the lead from the soil. And ironically, um, not ironically, part of uh, Mel Chin's approach is working with scientists to discover natural ways to remediate the soil. And one of those is another kind of plant, and I don't know the details, that actually the plant absorbs the lead from the soil and cleans the soil, and then that plant can be gone away and you end up with clean soil, which is sort of an amazing thing. Now, uh, it's much bigger than that, and I'm not, I don't know the details, but Mel Chin's was the second project, and that was really a case of an individual artist um, working um, in, in, a, in a really large way to achieve his project. And then the third project was to create Plessy Park and to have the place where Homer Plessy got on the railroad car that led to um, segregation, official segregation in the United States, um, happened in New Orleans at uh, what had been a railroad station. And so um, the press, there's now, um, a memorial, and the greatest aspect of that project was that the artists working with two student populations, one NOCA, which is our audition entry arts high school, which is an excellent school and which draws from all over the state, and Frederick Douglass High School, which was a predominantly African-American 
high school, and the two were rivals because you know the the the, the dynamics of uh, magnet schools are audition schools versus kids that are stuck in a really terrible public school that don't have the freedom to actually go and enter that kind of a system. So the kids were actually had a rivalry among themselves, and this project helped bring those two schools together to achieve the Plessy Park project. <clears throat> so then the second aspect um, was the mini grants, and I don't have the website, I, I can't get the archived website which has more details, so I'm sorry, I apologize for this tiny print. But these were, there were, um, three rounds of mini grants, and these were grants in the $500 to $1,000 range, tiny, some of them were $250. I mean, they were very small grants that went to, and they were, it was a very, very, very simple proposal process that artists in the community or cultural workers could apply for. Um, and um, some of the examples of the kinds of projects were um, a community garden, um, and a lot of story collecting, and I think that's one of the points, um, I think many of the other panelists will have specific stories to tell, but um, particularly for young people, the ability to talk about or illustrate or demonstrate their experience is a, an essential tool, I believe, led by artists to help them deal with the experience because the trauma of experiences like this for young people can often just be buried in their consciousness and not manifest itself for years. And so projects which bring artists to work with young people to tell their stories or to illustrate their stories or to make films about their stories, I mean, all the different creative processes that can help people to tell their own stories and to talk out loud, so to speak, and analyze what they've gone through is an incredible aspect of healing. So um, as you can see, the first round had um, five grants and they were, I think, five in the second round, and then round three had substantial more funding, and um, so there were more. Um, and some of these were, for instance, Junebug, Jabbo Jones, John O'Neill, this is an African-American theater company that's um, over 30 years old, uh, based in New Orleans. Um, Mardi Gras history and bead, bead sharing, sewing, sorry, the Mardi Gras Indian tradition of beading costumes. Um, was an important way for cultural culture bearers in New Orleans to be supported through these projects. And so um, it's really, to me, evidence of how far tiny bits of money can go, particularly when you're working in communities. And it's not that the artists didn't necessarily get paid for their work in these things. These were not all volunteer projects on the part of the artists. But um, the, the tiny bits of money help leverage um, opportunities for a lot of people. <coughs> So, how am I doing? Great, thank you. The, the other project that I want to just quickly mention um, is the more detail about the Home New Orleans project, and um, that's going to take a minute to load. So, um, I think rather than do that, I just want to mention another project that I don't have uh, media to show, um, and that is a project that uh, a New Orleans-based artist, Donald Harrison, who is an uh, internationally recognized jazz musician, um, did in Japan after the tsunami and the earthquake. And um, he has, um, he, those of you who were at the NPN annual meeting last year, the NPN Van annual meeting, Donald Harrison, his sister Cherise Harrison Nelson were the keynote at last year's annual meeting. And Donald um, organized with um, uh, the Japan Foundation a youth jazz orchestra in Japan, as well as one that had been organized in the United States after Katrina, and they went back and forth. So the young people actually traveled from New Orleans to Japan, performed there, worked with their young cohorts there, and then following that, the youth orchestra from Japan came to New Orleans and performed and did workshops and worked with the young people that were part of the group in New Orleans. And that was just a wonderful example of um, an artist who had the experience of participating in recovery after Katrina, of um, reaching out and our ability to take what we have learned and bring it to another place of disaster and share the resources and the knowledge with another community. And I think that's another important aspect about uh, disaster relief and recovery from the perspective of artists 
is how we can not just serve ourselves, but how we can offer what we have to the world. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can, can we ask a question or all at the end? If you don't mind holding, because there's okay. going to be a series of folks who are mm -hmm. going to do that. If you want to jot it down, it'd be great. Jose, thank you. So, I escaped on a stolen school bus three days after the levee breach. Uh, I was on the same bus that um, the iconic African American composer, uh, the septenarian, I think 70 plus years old, Alan Tucson was on. So literally, I escaped on a stolen school bus three days after the levees breached. I was trapped. Uh, Pre-Katrina, I had no car. I really, you know, I'd given up my car. I was touring a lot through the NPN. Uh, grateful to be here as well. This is my 20-year anniversary engaged with the NPN. And a lot of my work post-Katrina was about trauma. Uh, my own personal trauma of having to deal with the escape on a stolen school bus. That was rescuing African-American families. And we just happened to be in a position. And Alan Tucson was the iconic composer. Uh, many, many projects from, uh, uh, have been supported from the, uh, by the NPN and recently the Visual Arts Network. I'm just going to, as a performance artist and a multidisciplinary artist, train in the visual arts and literature as well, um, I used all my skills to, be, to do whatever I could um, to deal not only with my own personal trauma, but also the trauma of two communities, uh, predominantly the Latino immigrant community uh, that was reconstructing the loans that wasn't becoming part of the post Katrina narratives. And even still, you find, you're, you're hard pressed to, to find that out on a larger level outside of New Orleans. Um, then uh, I also got engaged with creating Latino youth theater projects as well, with undocumented youth, uh, photographic exhibits, and I'll, and I'll mention those. But I'm going to just give you a little excerpt of how I deal with performance trauma for me personally in, in relationship. Because I came back a month after the storm. And the first thing that I began doing was, uh, as soon as I got out, I was in Andre Kudrescu's house on the fourth day on September 1st. We got out we, you know, three days after the federal levies breached. We got out, and I was writing cyber essays, and that's all I spent uh, the first couple of weeks doing, cyber essays, until I got back to New Orleans on October 1st, and I actually sneaked back into the Maroney neighborhood, because the Maroney neighborhood was still not, uh, we were not being allowed to come back in. I, I you know, because of the nature of my intrepid uh, ways, uh, we got back into the Maroney, and um, uh, only the French Quarter was um, possible. So this is uh, part of the lowering morning ritual, but. Uh, I went down to St. James Infirmary, saw my caramel brown baby there. She was an undocumented immigrant worker. She had cleaned out the Superdome and Convention Center, but nobody, nobody, nobody was there to cry for her. Sin papeles se murió trabajando. Por una miseria de dólares, su sudor y su sangre regalando. She was living in a parallel universe, in a bizarre science fiction reality. Ubiquitous and invisible, simultaneously reconstructing the city that care and Bush forgot. But like much of her brown Latino family, her pain and suffering doesn't mean a lot to the likes of you and you and gringos generally. Era una mujer mestiza invisible para los blancos en general como mucha de su gente indocumentada. Sufriendo en la plena oscuridad, I went down to St. James Infirmary. My body overcome by grief, but I am here to tell her story and those of my paperback people because it's my, my destiny. After seeing my caramel brown baby there, dead at St. James Infirmary, I went down to the river and cried some more. With tears, I plotted this performance for her revenge. I went down to St. James Infirmary because I create from pain. So, um, for the last nine years plus, I've been dedicating my life um, to telling the untold story. And this is part of a, an, an essay that's in the book. It's called, Because I Dare to Remember in the United States of Amnesia. I believe in remembering people's truths. I believe that the writers and artists can be instrumental in creating work that serves 
as the conscience of our times. I believe in chronicling the personal experience to counter the official accounts that inevitably cultivate historical lies to silence and control and render some people invisible, those seem to be seedless, by disappearing them through the controlled mainstream media tentacles of misinformation. In the Latin American cultural tradition, the Latin, the, the, the playwright, the poet, the performer, has a responsibility to tell the people's story and chronicle that in whatever ways. After coming back, the first thing that I saw, like I had never seen ever in New Orleans, were thousands of Latinos everywhere, immigrant workers on the rooftops, putting up the blue tarps, transforming the city, reconstructing like a sort of locus of reconstruction angels that were back. And I, I found it to be incredible, but you should know that New Orleans has this long Spanish colonial legacy. There's a Latino community before the storm. There's a Vietnamese community before the storm as well. And these two communities basically got what I call browned out and yellowed out, right? So we, we didn't become part of the post-Katrina narratives because as much as I'm deeply connected to the African-American community and the Anglo community that supports a lot of my work in the alternative uh, aspects of the visual arts and theater in New Orleans, post-Katrina, New Orleans was defined as a purely black and white city. And that was, a, to me, that was a, an utter mistake in addition to the fact that we were coming back and you should know, Latinos, didn't just descend and converge. The city was under martial law. I couldn't escape. We couldn't get out three days after Levy's breach. I was there. I didn't watch it on TV. I became the first refugee to actually put together a performance, and that was the invitation by Leo Garcia of, of Highways after he read my first cyber essay called Hurricane Katrina and the Chaos of New Orleans. Because of my affiliations with people like Guillermo Gomez Peña and also um, Ariel Dorfman at Duke University, they sent they, they sent that and, and the NPN folks they sent that out through cyberspace and it you know it got printed and published in all kinds of places. But it, it spoke about the trauma of being trapped in a city that was under martial law. No one would talk about the fact that it was under martial law. You couldn't get in. You not even the Red Cross was allowed to come in and help us. But we got out on the stolen school bus, so I began writing cyber essays. Leo read the first one. He invited me to be an artist in residency. I was touring at the time, but we were exiled. We were forced into exile, right? So I come back and all of a sudden I'm wondering, if we're forced into exile and we've and the city's been under martial law, how is it that all these Latinos have converged here? <laughs> they were corporate coyotes. Now you all know the word coyotes, maybe some of you don't, right? You know, I'm a conceptual coyote, right? You know, I have a license to transport subversive and performance art across state lines and international waters, you know, so that's my Juan Bon kind of persona, and also the new one, Juan, Obi-Juan Kenobi, right, looking towards a new future. But they were brought in. Halliburton got the first no-bid contract, the same organization that got the first no-bid contract to reconstruct Iraq after the same Bush and Cheney family destroyed that, you know, Iraq, and look at the mess that we've left behind. So, so you could see the pattern. So they brought in, because I began interviewing, the first interview I did just for, informally on the streets on October of 2005 when I get back, I'm, I'm at Molly's, and the bars became community centers, right? The bars became community centers because the bars were the stores, anyone who would open, we were there telling each other stories. I come back, I interview a Puerto Rican gentleman now, Puerto Rican, US citizen. He tells me a story, uh, Halloween, October 2005. He had been working for three weeks. He had been promised on the third Friday to be paid the 1200 per week. That is $3,600 from working from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., right? He was there with another Mexican young man and they had been homeless because they were never paid, but I'll give you the exacts on that. So he's promised that they're gonna pay, be paid 1200 per week, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. working, right? And even further. He tells me that on that Thursday before that Friday payday, that mythic big payday, because that's the way they would hold out the immigrants and say, oh, we're gonna pay you next week. Oh, we're gonna pay you next week. Oh, we're gonna pay you next week. And 300 of them were actually housed in a gutted out uh, you know, factory warehouse because there was, you know, living spaces were very few. 70% uh, to 80% of the city was you know, devastated and flooded. On that Thursday before the payday, the New Orleans Police Department happens to raid their encampment. Mm -hmm. wow. Like the Migra. You know, with the sirens, woo, 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 they all scatter. No one gets paid. He, being a U.S. citizen, he's Puerto Rican, with very limited Spanish now, I mean, very limited English, because he's from the farmlands of Puerto Rico, right? Very, goes to the trailer parts because all, so Halliburton, subcontractor, 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 subcontractor. He goes to the subcontractor in a trailer to ask for his money. And he's got, you know, he's, you know, he's not speaking English so well. And that was advantageous to a lot of people who brought in undocumented immigrants because it became the great 21st century slave labor fiesta. 
right? Uh, you know, brown became, black became the new brown in terms of labor exploitation. With the Ashe Cultural Center, we've been working a lot around the issue of black and brown, you know, labor and wage theft exploitation, right? So he comes back and he asks at the trailer for his money and he's told, uh, no, the, the company's in Birmingham, you could walk there. By the time I meet him, he's homeless. And, that, and, and ironically enough, and um, there's a couple of manifestations of it, you know, uh, now I'm doing these drawings based on the Congress of Day Labors. Five minutes, yeah, good, I gave myself a five minutes, thank you. <laughs> good, I gave myself the five minutes as well. Um, one of the manifestations that recently has happened for me is this uh, Immigrant Dreams and Alien Nightmares. It's a collection of 25 years of performance poems, but uh, uh, many sections are, are actually about um, the post-Katrina, the alien immigrants and other evildoers, this, the piece that has been uh, commissioned through the creation fund process, which now gave me the funds to actually informally interview day laborers and work with the Congress of Day Laborers. And their stories, honestly, when I filmed them the first time, I went in 2010 when I began more, you know, I was going to David Labor pickup points. Eventually we got a grant from Roots when we actually presented the show at Ashe. We brought in the day labor community to bring in, come and see the show, right? And so I'm uh, doing a lot with, especially with Ashe, because with Black Brown Alliances. But when uh, I was filming, I would go to day labor pickup points just to hear the stories, because the stories were atrocious. But, I mean, they were difficult. I mean, you know, the stories of wage theft. Uh, one worker, immigrant laborer, Honduran, uh, was brought in at the age of 19. He came in two weeks after the storm, and I have to close my eyes to really kind of think about the details. And, and, I, and I have the honor of performing his story in the piece. He gets his hand cut in one of these jobs. He gets his, uh, a dumpster slices his left hand in two, right? And it's like bleeding, it's, you know, fingers are falling, that, you know, finally he gets to an ambulance. The, the contractor wouldn't even call an ambulance. Fortunately, his partner, his compadre, because it was just two of them on that day labor day where they were getting picked up, takes him to the university hospital. An African-American doctor connects with him because he's 19 years old at this moment. And he says, no, it's, it's traumatizing for you to cut your, or you cut your arm off because the other nurses and doctors had said, oh, we gotta prevent infection, we gotta cut your arm off, right? And, he, and this Af African-American doctor uh, connects with him because he's 19 years old. He said, no, we're going to reconstruct your hand. Mm -hmm. So I recon you know, they're reconstructing his hand over a three-month period, many surgeries. And he becomes one of the most amazing leaders of the Congress of Day Laborers. Like epic art, really beautiful, right? And uh, so there's some amazing stories because the Congress of Day Laborers to this day, the, the media in New Orleans, will not uh, they're forced to cover them now. But basically, there's been a media brownout. So a lot of people, even in New Orleans, they know everyone, no one can deny in New Orleans that the Reconstruction had tremendous great support. The new New Orleans, tremendous great support of uh, Latino immigrant workers, predominantly most of them undocumented. They are fighting for their right to remain right now. Hmm. So as a, as a visual artist, I've done the series with Space 111 called Somos Humanos, We Are Human, based on the photographs that I take of their manifestations and the public demonstrations of art manifestations, their installations. I also put together a Latino Youth Theater Project with Quentin New Orleans to work with the, uh, there's a, a plethora of immigrant children there. Many of them, and now 30%, the statistic is 30% of the new children being born in New Orleans are of Latino immigrant parents, right? So uh, a lot of dreamers there as well, but pre-Katrina has also been a large uh, immigrant community. But uh, working with undocumented youth and using, uh, using performance and theater for them to tell and cultivate their own stories. And that's what Puente Chino owns with the support of the Jazz and Heritage Foundation. It's been launched. We were on hiatus last year because they're going through leadership transitions. I also put together a really big project at National Press for the fifth anniversary called Los Invisibles. That was nine photographers with beautiful fine art photography of um, photographs of the, of the immigrant workers. And you know, it received national press. It was the show. Doug McCash wrote about it for the fifth anniversary. We had 300 people at the opening. At the opening, people gave me testimonials. I worked with Barristers Gallery. They've been the gallery right, you know, right down the block from me because I live at the corner. I live at St. Claude and Marigny, and I have the interesting distinction of owning a house as well because you know, with my ex-wife, we were able to purchase a home for our boys. And I have two. Uh, I've also contributed to the rebirth in a real big way. I have two children. Uh, that are part of that rebirth, and uh, that's Darius Amantu, who's gonna be uh, eight soon, and he's going to the international school. Or, you know, it's a charter school, and that's a really good one. And also Diego Arjuna, uh, my little boy who's five. So, you know, um, uh, I never thought I was gonna have children, right? So, uh, post-Katrina, the trauma, the mortality facing, <laughs> we had children, uh, and they're beautiful, and then, you know, part of that big contribution. Um, the next project that's happening, it's called the Aliens Talk for Truck Theater Project, and it's being um, put to, uh, with the support of Living Arts of Tulsa and um, 
of Pangea World Theater, and we're trying to transform a used vehicle to actually have the, the day laborers be protagonists for their own stories. I'm just a catalyst artist. I'm just trying to get the funding to make it because we're going to move, you know, we want to bring the stories through, through cities in the Gulf South that have actually, you know, have been reconstructed post not only Katrina but Vita, and then shoot up to the Mississippi to deal with the issue between New Orleans, Tulsa, and Minneapolis, up the Mississippi in terms of uh, stories of immigrant laborers because. The most dehumanized people right now across the country are the immigrant laborers. And not only not, not only not repaired New Orleans, but they repaired you know cities like Houston post post the other storm. I think it was Ike that hit Houston really badly. So um, yeah, that's just been my basic crusade to tell the story of the Latino immigrant workers and our contributions to the reconstruction. I am very happy to be able to share uh, my experience with yours related to the uh, disaster relief. I cannot uh, do my presentation in English, so uh, Kyoko Yoshida uh, at the end will help uh, to convey my story. えっと、私たちアントニオリンクという団体は、えっと、日本で唯一のアントニオリンクを中間支援団体で、えっと、自らもアントニオリンクをやっている23の理事の人たちと約40の、40団体のメンバー、そして200人の全国の団体さんと協
it was scheduled right one week after March 11th, as you see. この時私たちはあの私たちのメンバーも東北にたくさんいましたで連絡がつながらない状態でこのフォーラムを開催するかどうかというのは非常に悩みました Actually, 日本中が大混乱する中でさらに、えー、と原子力発電所の、えー、爆発もあったりしてとても情報が混乱していたさなかったことでした全国の NPO のメンバーから私たちのところにメールが届きました。ぜひフォーラムを開催してほしいという声でした。Throughout Japan,、uh, our NPO、uh, members sent、uh, email asking to go ahead and please have this convening. そして201人のメンバーが集まりまして、全国から集まりまして、で今この時期に、この時に私たちに何ができるのかということを話し合いました。<笑> so we changed the agenda completely and what we did was to talk. What we can do now. As Japan being a seismic country, there have been、uh, major earthquakes in the past too.、Uh, more recent, recently, in 1995, there was a Hanshin Awaji earthquake,、uh, and then there were artists who were involved in the、uh, recovery efforts, so we invited those artists to this convening as well. And so Do right at this point, the most important thing is to save lives. しかしながら、阪神・淡路大震災の後、えー、彼らの生活が安定する中でたくさんの人が自殺したんですね。で、But uh, uh, looking back at the、uh, 1995 earthquake, when things got、um, back to slowly normal,、uh, so many people killed themselves. つまり、えー、復興の中で必要なのは、衣食住もさることながら、喜びと人々のつながりが必要だということをすでに私たちは知っていました。Um, so this is a reminder that、um, in addition to,、uh, to, to live,、uh, in, in addition to wear, eat, and、uh, live in a house,、uh, people need something more,、uh, something that gives them power to continue their life. そこで、えー、と私たちは今できることはないかもしれないがこれから必ずアート NPO アーティストが必要な時がもうすぐ来るとだから活動の自粛をせずにみんなはいつでも動けるようにしてほしいというメッセージを出しました。So, um, it, it may be true that artists and、um, arts nonprofits, there may be nothing that we can do right at this particular moment, but there will be、uh, projects that can help people、uh, very soon. So we should think about that. で私たちはこのアート NPO, ーアート NPO フォーラムを通して、えー、アート NPO リンクとしてできることが何かということを考えてこの4つのアクティビティを作りました。So, uh, as, um, my organization, Arts NPO Link,、uh, decided to、uh, build this Arts NPO Aid、uh, with four areas of key activities. 一つは、阪神・淡路大震災の時にたくさんアーティストが活動を行ったんですが、その記録が当時一切残っていなかったという問題があり、アーティストがその被災地において活動するにあたって、どのような経験をし、知恵を蓄積したかというのが見えなかった、それに頼ることができなかったということの反省に立ち、記録、アーティストの活動を記録するということをまず重要視しました。There have been no record of what artists did、uh, to help the release 
relief, relief of the disaster. And therefore, uh, again, when this happened, uh, there was no way that people can reference what has been uh, learned in the past. We really thought we should um, put some resource and efforts into uh, documentation this time because uh, earthquake, this is not the last earthquake. So with this in mind, we had uh, 52 uh, pieces of uh, reports or uh, documentation uh, with uh, visual audio, uh, including interviews. Uh, we have 52 pieces up on the website. So, we The other thing we did was to uh, fundraise so that uh, artists can um, create work. というのは日本中がすべてストップしている状態でアーティストの活動もストップしました。助成金もストップしました。劇場もストップしました。This is because uh, you know Japan in a way was kind of everything ceased. Uh, no funding continued. Uh, a lot of the theaters and shows uh, programmed uh, got canceled. It, there was a whole uh, sense of you have to self-restrain in this kind of uh, atmosphere to do shows, not to do shows. So for this reason, we uh, collected money donation for about $70,000, uh, uh, out of which $52,000 uh, dollars approximately uh, distributed to the artists to, to do projects related to disaster relief. The other thing uh, we were able to put together was uh, get a PA system donation from TOA uh, Corporation and we were able to uh, deliver that to the, some of the areas to do um, programs. Uh, also, we are coordinating between the, the areas of these devastated areas with uh, artists or arts and PO, no profits, so that uh, we are kind of doing the, the match, so that the uh, right person go to the right place. So uh, these are some of the areas that we matched and we um, went in and uh, provided supports. Uh, I want to give you some examples of uh, actual programs we did. Uh, visual slash conceptual artist Endo Ichiro uh, was in the area, uh, went into the uh, devastated area uh, two months after the tsunami. He went not as an artist to create work, but he just went there to help as a volunteer to take up the rubbish. で、彼が地元の方からアーティストであるならば今この状況を変えてほしい。とても自分で気持ちを変えてほしい。ぜひ祭りをやってほしいということを頼まれます。but the uh, local community uh, people came to him and said, well, you are an artist. Can you please do something that can uh, cheer us up? Because we are so depressed and so sad. So uh, he, the artist, um, reached out to his resources, and uh, that included uh, the uh, arts NPO link. So, of course, we were able to provide him some uh, small fund to just to begin with so that he can start, uh, continue to be there and uh, uh, do his work. And uh, the idea was to create a community slash street festival called Matsuri in Japan, the community celebration. Uh, so that included uh, like street food uh, cook-off vendors, and uh, that was a particular area that Arts and PO Link wanted to uh, get involved. So uh, 
so because we are arts organization, and that was the uh, request from the community, uh, he brought in the uh, uh, food artist. しかし、あえっと、たくさんの支援物資の中にパスタがあったんですね。しかし、パスタはあのお湯が沸かせないと食べれないということでも、とても困ったものとしてそこにあったんです。Uh, many people send in、uh, food, uh, uh, transportable food, that included pasta.、Uh, but you need、uh, to、uh, make hot water and make pasta. So there were、uh, like a small mountain of pasta piling up. <laughs> <laughs> no electric speed, no gas. How eat in the hospital? <laughs> So, what the、uh, food artist did was to、uh, utilize the, use those pasta but、uh, make it with the taste of the local. で、えっと、300食を用意したんですが、えっと、1000人以上来てしまってもうあっという間になくなったんですがあそこは他のボランティアのあ支援の方々と一緒に協力してえいくつかの食を提供することができました。遠藤一郎は人々をつなぐのがとても得意なアーティストです。で彼はあの他の NPO にも協力を呼びかけて、例えば、えー、被災地で、えー、とてもちっちゃなあの場所だけで生活している人に対するマッサージを提供する人たちの NPO とも協力をしました。遠藤は非常に良いアドリーチングをする人たちに協力をしてそれを見つけたらメッセー Uh, and uh,、um, because people were contained in a very small space and all tensed up, they had those、uh, massage therapies. So, in this country, there are many Kyodo Gaynons. The Kyodo Gaynons are the ones who are in the world. The Kyodo Gaynons are the ones who are in the world. Also, this、uh, street community festival,、uh, one of the programs he did was the uh, uh, performance uh, by and about local traditional、uh, folk arts. This is a Kagura dance which has about 400 years history. So, he was working with the children's future. Also, he had this、uh, series of uh, uh, work that to fly kite up into the sky, a、uh, uh, lot of them because children will write. Their hope and dreams on the so, conceptually, of course, even with this、uh, devastated and depressing situation, we cannot lose dream and hope for the future for the children, particularly. So, I would like to share some of the things that I would like to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. これは、えっとえー、人口、えー、と数百人のとても小さな村です。This is a village called Jusan Hama, which is really about,、uh, about a population of about 250-ish,、uh, very small village. で、えっと、NPO パルクという団体がここの支援に入っていました。And、uh, there was a non-profit organization by the name of Parsik. Park, um, Park. Um, but which was、uh, trying to help the、uh, uh, disaster relief efforts. のの This was a, a kind of like a social facilitation organization that Uh, in order to reach the consensus of what should be done in terms of uh, uh, changes of the, of the design, the, whether, whether the vill- whole village, which is totally devastated, should go up to the hill、uh, and just move, or to build higher,、um, what do you call the bars or the で、えっと、この NPO から私たちに協力の要請がかかったんです。And, uh, Parsic, uh, reached out to 
というのは、えー、とこの町には400年続く獅子舞のお祭りがありました。This is because, um, In this little village, there was this、uh, traditional folk art、uh, which has been、uh, performed there for the past 400 years. Everything, including all the um, precious um, traditional masks,、um, the、uh, costumes, they were all gone. However, three Days later, they found one head of the lion、uh, floating、um, on the sea.、Mm-hmm. そして彼らは心に誓ったんですね。またこの祭りを絶対に再興する、復活させると。So all the villagers saw that and, and decided we have to not let, let this go. We're going to do this again. なぜなら祭りは地域の人々同士をもう一つなぎ直すことができるからです。Because this kind of traditional festival and performances can、uh, connect everyone's heart again to one. しし However, Parsik does not、uh, specialize s in the、uh, art, so that's why they reach out to the arts in b u i l d i n g そこで私たちはネットワークを駆使して、獅、え、子、っと、米を修復してくれる職人さんを探しましたで。最初、東京の職人さんを探したんですが、東京もたくさんの支援要請が来ていて手が動かなかったので、私たちは東北の職人さんを探すことにしました。Um, first, um, it was, so in order to make this happen, make this、uh, restore the,、uh, the performance, he's、um, tried to、uh, reach or find A、uh, craftsman person who can rebuild and create the head、uh, and the mask.、Uh, first, he looked in Tokyo, but uh, uh, the, to- the whole Tokyo was actually bombarded by、uh, lots of requests to help the devastation, so he couldn't find someone who can help、uh, in Tokyo. So he reached out to Iwate Prefecture, which is also in the Tohoku area, and finally found a Craft artists who can do it. てて This was actually wonderful because、um, the, the people of this village,、uh, when they looked at the、uh, new mask created by the Iwate、uh, craft, craftsman, said, This looks like our. Uh, our guy, our、uh, lion, because this, this looks like Tohoku, the northeastern <coughs> face. そして、えっと、このパルシックに、えっと、助成金の先をいくつか提供を教えましたそして私たち自身もファンドを使って彼らに、えー、約20万か支援をしました。So, uh, the uh, Art NPO Link itself、uh, gave about $2,000 from their own fund, but also、uh, Passed on all the information of possible funders to Parsik. And so the fundraising、uh, took about two years, but、uh, in 2013, yes, they were able to restore this traditional、um, program. So, in the past, So,、uh, what's next is、uh, where they are. What can we, you do from here? So, what's next is where they are. What can you do from here? So, what's next is where they are. What can you do from here? So, what's next is where they are. What can you do from here? So, what's next is where they are. What can you do from here? So, what's next is where they are. What can you do from here? So, really,、uh, this is really the time to actually prepare for the next big disaster.、Uh, what should we、uh, keep in mind? What has been done? And what can we pass on? When this disaster happens next time. Therefore, I'm very happy to be here to、uh, share my experience here about yours and your uh, wisdom uh, and the experience, and collectively, collectively we can、uh, prepare for the future disaster. Thank you.
that up. Um, that was fascinating. I had not been familiar with um, uh, uh, the Japanese organization, but in many ways it parallels the National Coalition for Arts Preparedness and Emergency Response, which has evolved here in the US, and which I'll start by talking about. together, um, just as you all did, a forum of arts leaders around the country to say, what, what do we need to do now? Um, and out of that emergency fundraising and assistance program really evolved the coalition. Um, I'm going to go in a slightly different direction than our other speakers, but in the end I think you'll see it's all going to tie together. Um, so the coalition was really designed as a safety net for artists and arts organizations. Um, it's uh, been funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Joan Mitchell Foundation and a lot of in-kind support from its members across the country. Um, the key activities, um, let's see if I can turn this up, I know I'm blocking some people's view of the screen. Um, some of the activities that have been undertaken by the coalition, the Arts Responder Handbook. Um, the bad news is that crises of all kinds are happening more and more frequently. Uh, the good news is that we're learning and we're building up some, some capacities and some best practices in terms of responding to them. So the Arts Responder Handbook, which will be published next year, is really a collection of advice and best practices by those who've been through it, from 9-11 to Sandy um, and all kinds of crises in between. Um, it's really for, it's um, created for the point of view of funders and arts service organizations, um, but we're actively working on, I, I'm advocating for two additional pieces. One is for state and local arts agencies. I think have a lot of capacity, if not funding, at least as a convener. And also the work of individual artists, because there are a lot of best practices coming out of the work of individual artists and communities. Um, so I'm here to say that if something happens in your community, um, you don't have to be alone, and you don't have to start from scratch. Um, call on the coalition, because we have tools and, and the connectivity to um, uh, help you work with people who've um, been through situations before. Um, we're also um, training arts responder networks. Um, these are groups of funders and service organizations in cohesive communities who then are able to respond. They already put their plans in action. And I'm going to be talking a lot about the preparedness side of this. Um, so in Southern California and in, um, uh, the, it's called the SoCal Responder Network, and then in New York, Culture Aid have come together as networks so that they're ready if a crisis happens they can collectively work on assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so then they each can play to their strengths and they're not missing needs and opportunities and they're working collaboratively. Um, also, um, oh, and advocacy. Um, there's an arm of the coalition that's been working really hard, particularly with FEMA um, and the Small Business Administration because individually uh, employed artists as well as other self-employed artisans and tradesmen are totally left out of a lot of the ways that you can get compensated or get loans. Um, if you are, for instance, lose your studio um, after a disaster. So we're working to fill in those gaps with the federal um, agencies. Some of the other member activities that you should just be aware of, I won't go in depth. Um, Studioprotector.org is a project of SURF, Craft Emergency Relief Fund, and it is designed for craft artists, but it really is great for any individual practicing artist with tools on how to prepare your space, protect your work, document your work, and then what to do in the event of a crisis. It has great tools or if you need to you know, evacuate in 20 minutes, what you take with you. Um, artsready.org, I'll talk a little bit more about at the end, that's a tool for organizations. So we've kind of divvied it up, studio protectors for artists, arts readies for organizations. Um, uh, the actorsfund.org, they have an incredible array, as does NIFA source on their website, of tools, particularly for recovery, um, for artists and artist-run organizations, a lot of social service and mental health um, options are there for you and you can search them by where you are. Um, and they're not just for members of these organizations and they're not just for actors, they're for artists of all disciplines. 
So to talk a little bit about the continuum, um, we've talked a lot here about response and recovery, those parts of it. I'm here to talk a little bit more about preparedness, but this really is a continuum. And if you have um, some type of crisis, you know, you're gonna loop back and forth on this. Um, what I thought I'd do is share some basic readiness principles that might help those of you in this community. Um, here way, here's reasons why to be ready. Um, the first is that readiness is just honestly less expensive. Um, the big, you know, Oxfam and the World Bank have done estimates with natural disasters, and it's somewhere I've heard anywhere from three to nineteen dollars in preparation is saved in a disaster. From um, uh, it would be that much more expensive to recover. Um, of course, it protects unique cultural and artistic assets. Your work doesn't exist if it's destroyed. We all have a responsible responsibility to steward, um, you know, our own creative investment, and so it protects those assets. Um, and it also provides peace of mind. You know, we're doing fine at my organization, and it's just good to get your fears out on the table and say, if this happens, what are we gonna do? When you have an answer, you feel a lot better. Some basic um, response facts. Um, first of all, human life and safety come first. So anything that I talk about presumes that we're talking about kind of the business operations or your artistic practice. This is after you and your family and your home are safe or you're where you can be safe. Um, Secondly, as, as has been said today, um, artists and arts organizations often respond first and independently, which is great. That's the spirit of this community. Mm -hmm. um, but you shouldn't have to do it alone, and you shouldn't have to do it uncompensated. You should also be prepared, um, because um, again, you're often left out of the formal response network. Um, the coalition and our partners are really advocating with community leaders about how in any disaster response um, process in a community, they need to bring in artists and creatives as part of that process because you all have some of the best thinking to offer. Um, but also um, that other aid workers, I mean there are certainly wonderful volunteers in VOADS and the Red Cross, um, but other um, cultural responders can, are compensated. And so those of us who are in the funding cycle need to be actively advocating for you all to be brought in as professionals in this process. Some basic recovery facts, right? So um, we've moved through response, which is right after, um, into recovery. Recovery can often be a really long-term prospect, um, months and years. I mean, New Orleans is still, I couldn't say the percentage of recovery, but it's nowhere near 100%. Um, so um, there's opportunity to continue this work. Donor fatigue is common. Um, so that's also something to fight against and to just kind of keep things on the radar. Um, Artists and arts organizations are often prone to serving the community at their own expense. Um, and so I just want to warn you about that, that, you know, take care of yourself. It's that old thing of, you know, put the oxygen mask on first before the person next to you. Make sure that you are well and you have what you need. Um, and finally, you might need some specialized training and expertise in order to do this. Um, you know, the Colorado Council for the Arts um, uh, supported um, the work of poetry and filmmakers for the students at Columbine after the shootings. You don't, don't just pick an artist off a roster for something like that. You really need someone who's gonna be able to adequately deal with that kind of trauma. Um, Craig Nutt, a great um, artist out of Nashville after the Nashville floods, um, was commissioned along with seven other artists to do pieces for a project called Watermarks that dealt with the floods in community. And he said that his, um, on my piece I envisioned it as a bench, a place that people could gather to remember the event and relate stories about it, very powerful. Um, and my main idea was the bench depicting the flood zone. But one committee member was a psychologist. My first design was a lot more literally connected with people's stories. And she felt that some of the images I had recommended had the danger of re-traumatizing re the children. Mm -hmm. um, so as an artist, we we're really focused on creating as powerful a piece as possible, but it could be too powerful. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, don't walk in to a situation that you may not be um, able to handle at least without getting some context and assistance. I'm gonna run really fast because I want you to be able to take home something and do it, you know, Friday when you get back to your studio or your office. Mm -hmm. Some basic readiness and preparedness principles. Number one is redundancy. Have copies of stuff. Have it all over the place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in all kinds, right? Paper, digital, all kinds of stuff. Um, also disperse it, um, both the digital and the hard copies. Um, Three Legged Dog is a performance and theater company out of New York, you may know, um, and they actually were part of our design team for the Arts Ready tool, and they had data in three different places. Oh, thank you, Frank. Um, so they had stuff on disks um, in the office, 
They also, as you should, have an off-site regular database backup on an off-site server. Their server was in World Center Tower number one. So their third desk was in like their costume director's underwear drawer in the Bronx. And it was safe, and that's what they used. So they have spreading it around. You know, try to get stuff out of state if you can. Just do regular um, dispersal of your, your key information. Have multiple communication methods. Don't rely on just one. Know how you can reach people by text, by, by personal email, not just their work email, phones. You know, you're gonna have to have multiple communication mm -hmm. methods. Text often works when cell phones don't. Um, if you're in an organization, have one central coordinator. They don't have to make all the decisions, but just make sure that somebody has all the information going in and out because otherwise people can spin and waste time. And in a crisis, time wasted is one of the worst things that can happen. Um, Cross-training and just making sure that other people um, have some sense of what to do in your absence. I know particularly in small organizations or if you're an individual artist, this is um, really hard, but just think about elements where you can make sure that others have some access to information or could pick up if you left off. Um, have control of your technology. <laughs> we were setting up for this session, it's like, where's Joe? The guy who came in, because many of us are held hostage by our IT guy, I'm just saying, so don't. Make sure multiple people have the passwords, know how to update your website, have access to your database, all that stuff. Um, and the right connections. <laughs> and have the right connections. Um, also, you know, and I say, you know, this is kind of at South Arts, what I see our role is, and NPN Band and other service organizations, be a beacon for the arts. You know, in an emergency, there are lots of stories that the media is going to get drawn to, and often the arts are left out of that story because we don't want to be pushy. We want to help. We'll be in the background. We'll do this, but we really need to, to, I think, advocate for ourselves and say, you know, we are part of the solution. We are part of what makes communities resilient, um, and so we need to speak up for that. Um, I'm going to take just a minute or two. How many minutes do I have left, Steve? You have uh, two and a half minutes. Perfect, I'm gonna do this fast. Um, this is gonna sound like a commercial, but it's kind of more of a public service announcement. Um, because when we got into this work at South Arts back in 2006, um, we went out there and not only did no artists or arts organizations have readiness plans, but when we talked to them, they had no idea how to start them. I don't know what to do. Um, so thanks to um, an initial investment by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, um, and they were followed by um, gifts from the uh, Doris Duke Charitable Foundation and the endowment. Um, South Arts has developed an online planning tool called Arts Ready. I'm gonna run through it really fast. I'm around all day today. I'm really pleased to say that NPN Van came on board as one of our first partners, um, offering access to this tool as a member benefit. Um, and so you can get information from me on how you can join at a discount. Um, and this really, it was developed for organizations, particularly presenters, but we found in the four years um, since this has been launched that there are elements that really do work for um, producing and touring ensembles as well. Um, so uh, basically, we have a website, artsready.org. Um, there's lots of information on it. This is free. You can go there and get tips and tools. We have a library of resources. Um, again, you can join um, uh, basic membership for free. If you want to drop your card with me, I'll make sure you get signed up for that. Um, the paid membership is at a discount for you as an um, NPN band member. Um, our library, we try to, the whole idea here is that, again, people have been unfortunately going through situations and you don't need to start from scratch. So we have gathered, wherever we can, the best material, templates, case studies, articles, um, uh, pol example policies, so that you can um, find what you're looking for and not have to Google it yourself. Really quickly, what the tool does is allow you to um, do an assessment of your organization based on whatever types of activities you're active in. This takes you about an hour, and there are links to help you all along the way. All of your answers move over to a project management, a to-do list, and it says, you know, I'm going to, within a month, I'm gonna get my crisis communications plan together, and here's a sample in the library that's gonna, I can copy from. Um, you store your critical stuff. This is not your data backup, but this is the stuff that, if you can't get to your computer, you need to get your insurance policy, and your board list, and you know, your um, copies of how you do your online banking, um, you also can even put stuff in here like, um, oh, I took that slide out, I'm sorry. You can put a type in like, here's how to turn off the main water if there's a flood, mm -hmm. so that you know, if you're not there, somebody can just quickly look it up, and this is cloud-based, and it's always accessible to you. Um, 
So, and then the last is the Battle Buddy Network. Um, this was created for the situations where people mean well, but there's a mountain of pasta, or in Newtown, there were mountains of teddy bears. And that's really sweet, but that doesn't help. So what this is, is for the arts community, we can match make what the needs are, when they're needed, with the type of response and material that's there. So um, that's my spiel for Arts Ready. Um, and there's information on it, but I, I want to applaud the work of my other speakers, and I've learned a lot today, and thanks for your time. So we're a little bit over time, but I'd like to just um, uh, ask two things. One is if you need to leave, take care of yourself, but do it quietly. There may be a few people who want to stay for a few questions. I think our presenters are willing to stay. So um, if there are, are there any other are there questions or comments from folks that are here, we're going to stay for a few minutes. Yeah. Just leave. If you need to leave, we understand. Just leave quietly. Evaluations, please. Please take, yeah, please do do an evaluation. Did you have a question, Eric? Very, very briefly, uh, uh, MK, uh, so Transforma came in. Yeah. Um, did they bring their funding with them? Did they first assess and then go to funding? What is, what's the time lag in something like that? Mm. Okay, well, we were very fortunate in New Orleans that many national funders jumped in right away with very little. It wasn't, um, well, our next deadline is um, in October, and you can submit a proposal then, and we make our decisions at our February board meeting. It was not like that. So there was definitely financial resources that came in. Transformer fundraised for itself all along. Before? Yeah, well, no, they, 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 they came in without any funding, um, but they did have relationships with some funders, and the Andy Warhol Foundation was the first that responded for tra responded for Transforma. Um, um, truthfully, I think Rick Lowe was on the board of Warhol at the time. <laughs> but the fact is, is that many, many national foundations, uh, Mellon, Ford, uh, Rockefeller, um, the National Endowment for the Arts, really came in quickly, and then others more slowly. So transform a fundraise for itself as it went along. Um, and things like Open Society Institute came in, the Annenberg Foundation, a lot of not, okay. not traditional arts funders um, saw the value of this project. And, um, and just to full disclosure, NPN was the intermediary for it. So it didn't have to get its own 501c3. It didn't have to set up an infrastructure to manage the money. NPN. Uh, provided office space, um, telephone, um, the project bought its own computer. Um, uh, so it paid for itself, but our infrastructure was there to support it. Any other questions? And it's not the only project that we supported of this kind, but Transformer was one of the biggest. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes, Susan? Um, uh, uh, Mom, thanks for the presentation. Um, the principles of preparedness seem to be about office records and communications. Could you speak a bit about collections and sort of materials of artists and um, how one prepares for that? Sure, that's a great question. And I have to be honest, I'm not an expert on that because of our work being very organizationally based. Um, there are good collections management tools out there and we actually are talking about how to connect that to these kinds of preparedness assessments, but that we just haven't had the capacity to um, well, uh, You showed the slide, sense. Surf Plus. Is mm -hmm. one of the ones who do that. You know, Surf Plus. They're, they're, that is an organization that's doing it specifically for certain kinds of artists, but that actually translates to lots of kind of visual yeah, artists. It, yeah, it actually it, it does, and also some writers. Um, uh, we have found that other studio artists can access that. So, I, StudioProtector.org um, is the website, and I would say for individual artists. I think the big question of readiness for collections management. We're in conversation with Heritage Preservation, mm -hmm. um, which does a lot of that for cultural. Um, more historical sites, and so they are, um, as we're in conversation, they're more and more um, alert to the fact that we need to be having these conversations together mm. with the arts community. So I think that's probably our next big wave. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? Yes. I have a question for Sari. Um, I really enjoyed the presentation, and I noticed that in several cases with the examples, there was a community member or an artist that decided to call upon this network for support. So my question is, how do, you, how do you make it known that mm. the network is available for support? How do you make it known that, that there is that resource? Mm. 
そのプロモートでウェブページをあの、あの、販促しますか。販促。紹介とか、人がすぐになんていうかしら、あの、例えば震災、あ、とかって、あの、グーグルしたらパッと there were similar intermediary organizations and efforts who were trying to uh, connect the artist resources with uh, disaster needs. Um, they naturally noticed that they should work together, so they all uh, did the co uh, linking um, with each other, and that way it was. It did. It did work that uh, uh, people, once they, for example, Google uh, the disaster and arts uh, relief, uh, disaster relief arts, the, one of them, uh, one of those intermediaries will be uh, coming up on the top. Come on. So that, Yes, so uh, really uh, co-promoting uh, with uh, being the funder of uh, association of uh, corporations or um, another intermediary, intermediary code 3331. They all uh, link and uh, co-promote. We're good. Okay. I think I think we're good. I know we're running behind. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming Thank and you. staying. Thank you. 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 Thank you.